Today, Armada, we'll be solving a mystery. That mystery is, why does everyone hate Velma? Well, there are four main reasons as to why, but I also bring forth a hidden gem of what could have turned this show around if they actually wanted to save the show. Now, every detector needs a partner in crime, so alongside me will be the crit nerd. The biggest reason as to why everyone is upset at this show is Velma herself. When making a revival of a show, you're bringing with you fans that have resonated with the previous versions of that media. The one thing that is universally never worked when reviving media is fundamentally not understanding why people enjoy the characters that come from it. And that's Velma. I'm not just a waitress, I'm also a basic bitch who doesn't even know how to use hashtags. However, I feel like we need to address the elephant in the room. <clears throat> the Indian elephant. When the still image of Velma finding Brenda's head sliced off made its rounds on Twitter and the conversation was about race swapping. And why not just make an original character if you wanted to make a main character who's a person of color? And I've always found this argument kind of silly because at its core, there are good and bad characters of every race and writing is flexible so you can make a good or bad Indian Velma because it's about the execution more than the concept. While I do understand that certain media is marketed on its minority representation, representation cannot fully replace solid storytelling. So basically what I'm trying to say is Vilma's character was not going to be made or broken based on her skin color. And this show proved that almost immediately. I'm a suspect. I thought lesbians were good at solving crimes. It's like the one positive stereotype perpetuated by cop shows. Although going off of two episodes so far, Velma has shown so many unsatisfying qualities that an outside fan of Scooby-Doo, myself, felt immediately. I did not enjoy this aspect of Velma being holier than Dow because she's smart because it told me very little about her character if they intended for that to be the flaw. It just made her as annoying as the rest of the town, only it's worse for her because her supposed brain should make her know better. Even simple scenes like this fry scene here are supposed to be taken as a joke, but it just makes her insufferable for complaining so much. Dad, you can't just eat soggy fries from the takeout container. You have to crisp them in the oven first. Man, shut so This has been done before. There has been a show that had mature themes. It had a female lead that was easily irritable, and I enjoyed that show a lot. It was Infinity Train. Tulip complains a lot, and for good reason. She's trapped in a train, has no idea what to do, where to go, or why the number on her hand changes and what happens if it hits zero. Her complaining had weight to the story, but it also told you about her character. It wasn't just complaining for the sake of complaining. In my end, as a big Scooby-Doo fan, the I'm smarter than you attitude comes off as incredibly abrasive. While a bit understandable, as at this point, Mystery Inc. doesn't really exist and the gang have no real reason to like each other, it just makes Velma incredibly unlikable, period. She actually has quite a bit in common with Mystery Incorporated Velma, as both place high value in their respective intelligence and meet life with a dry wit and calling people out for their stupidity. But while these traits are shown to be abrasive in Mystery Incorporated, here they're meant to be endearing until they aren't. Dark. Dark. <coughs> White girl with too much money. <coughs> White girl with too much money. You don't know me. But Velma herself is hardly the only issue. The show's writing definitely feels as if it thinks it's smarter than it is, much like Velma herself. The constant acknowledgement of what traditional mystery and high school shows do, the numerous, often outdated pop culture references, the self-referential humor followed by looking right into the camera, and tropes upon tropes upon tropes. The way the dialogue is structured, it feels less like they're teenagers casually talking and more like they're TV writers in a pitch meeting and comparing notes. The reason why meta commentary works so much in other shows is because you don't expect it. Multiple times when watching these two episodes, I was just taken out of the immersion because the dialogue clearly isn't written from an in-universe perspective. Look, if you want to speak about these issues, just go to Twitter, quote tweet some random person who has the opposite take, and stand on your soapbox to pretend that you actually know something like everyone else does. I can't be the only person who thinks this views more as a commentary video disguised as a children's cartoon gone wrong. Not only that, but Velma falls into that niche that Rick and Morty started, where the characters just make fun of their audience and treat them like babies. Between the initial trailer having Velma act as a stand-in for disgruntled fans, and Velma cracking jokes about adults still watching cartoons, adults that this show is marketing itself towards by the way, and the show holds almost a bit of disdain for the people at home watching, which is the last thing you want to make the audience feel. You know what 420 is, right? Um, yeah, it's code for adults who still watch cartoons. The internet went crazy seeing these 
new versions of Fred, Daphne, and Norville. Yes, Norville, not Shaggy. However, the rabbit hole for the disdain of these characters go well beyond their looks. Fred Rogers never really had a lot of personality. He was the leader, he masterminded the traps, and he engaged with the mysteries for the most part. Plenty of attempts have been made to give a little extra weight to his character, but this time led to Fred being the spoiled rich white kid who never went through puberty, and thus disappoints his father by having underdeveloped Scooby Snacks and being casually racist. I'm caliente, as this one's people would say. Basically, Fred became a punching bag, an archetype for all the trust fund babies and rich kids out there that the show can easily make fun of. Even being accused of being the murder suspect doesn't really help his character any better. He's rich, he's white, he's ignorant. That's really all this show has to say about him. Faggy went from a scruffy looking cowardly food addict to a clean shaven simp for Velma. A big issue with Velma is the huge romance triangle going on and seeing Norville be the perpetual third wheel as Velma crushes on both Fred and Daphne. In fact, to interject there, it almost makes me look at the Velma and Daphne relationship differently because it's juxtaposed against Norville's well-meaning but futile efforts to woo Velma. In fact, the scenes I disliked most in the show so far were those scenes where Norville calms down Velma by speaking his heart and she immediately taking it as a joke. I like you. Like, like, like. You. I wasn't joking. Your face is why I get up in the morning. <laughs> You're the main character in all my dreams. <laughs> okay, stop. I'm peeing. I'm peeing. Yes, we've seen Shaggy and Velma in other shows, but in this show I had no idea what Norville sees in Velma, who's treated him like crap since his introduction. It almost feels like the show is trying to shield Velma and Daphne's perception with this layer of bisexuality, making it feel as if you did criticize this aspect, you're criticizing the fact that they're bi. They also really want to beat you over the head with the fact that Norville does in fact not do drugs, acting as if a clever little in-joke of the franchise is something that was a fact, and Velma is breaking the norm by making him squeaky clean. I think it has something to do with drugs, which I hate. A lot of the jokes are made at his expense on how pathetic he is and how badly he doesn't want to be associated with stoners, like how disappointed he was when he found out his food blog's primary audience was people who smoke weed. The only real connective tissue to any other version of Shaggy Norville has is his love for snacks. This leads us into Daphne, who had the most predictable change of a story like this. Take the popular girl and turn her into a huge bitch who ditched you to be cool. What? However, being predictable doesn't have to be bad, and this isn't the reason why I found Daphne to be lacking. For one, she goes from a cold, uncaring popular girl to a girl of substance within two episodes, despite the only major thing happening to her is that her boyfriend got arrested. I get the vibes that Daphne is supposed to be holding back repressed feelings for Velma based on their previous friendship. However, outside of a flashback within the interrogation scene with Velma and the beginning of the second episode, we don't really get Daphne's side of her feelings. Ironically, so far, she's been portrayed to be the girl, except in this show, she's the girl girl who likes girls. All of her personality traits so far depend on other people. She hops from being Velma's rival to Fred's unsatisfied girlfriend to Velma's potential girlfriend, but who exactly is Daphne? To interject, this is a question that a lot of people ask. People assume that Daphne is just the pretty girl who gets kidnapped, but she has gained a lot of layers to her character since then. She's quirky, she's ambitious, she's a hopeless romantic, but in this iteration, all I can really say about Daphne is she's popular, she has two moms. Moms. She's a drug dealer. You know how different I am from my moms. I need to find out who I really am. Where do I come from? And how is my hair the color of buffalo wings? I will say this, even though Daphne doesn't do much of anything, she's the best of the gang so far, including Velma. And speaking of do, Scooby-Doo, where are you? Not here. The absence of Scooby-Doo was not something that went unnoticed by the public. People were wondering exactly how Scooby-Doo was going to fit in a universe like this until it was revealed exactly how by not being a part of it. After speculation and discussion on exactly who it is to blame, Mindy Kaling confirmed that it was the studio executive's decision to not include Scooby because he didn't fit with the more mature tone of the series. Fans of the series were incredibly quick to point out that Scooby being a talking dog has worked in a lot of serious iterations before, including Zombie Island, Mystery Incorporated, and the Supernatural crossover. However, beyond a poor main character, poor iterations of the gang, and failed attempts at meta-commentary, the most annoying 
annoying factor is its insecure use of raunchiness. Now, when making mature shows, one way that shows like to distinguish themselves from others is to immediately cross over that kid-friendly boundary and show how adult they are by swearing, showing nudity, drugs, alcohol, and a sprinkle of commentary. Believe it or not, I do think raunchy has its place. In fact, there was a show that ironically was on HBO Max that I enjoyed a lot, and it had raunchy moments. Go on, find our car, boy! Gringo Cabron! Ah! So how come I have no problems with scenes like this, but I have an issue when Velma does it? Simple. When Close Enough does it, it has great characters and a great story to fall back on. So when it adds raunchiness, it doesn't feel like it's compensating. Symbolically, in the way that Velma, the character, overcompensated for her lack of palatable traits by unapologetically and obnoxiously behaving in a contrarian fashion, unnecessarily hyping up the surface level qualities in herself, but also the assumptions of others, which resulted in the ostracization of her peers, is exactly what this show is doing for the Scooby Doo community. Regardless of the the stereotypes you wish to break down, regardless of the archetypes you wish to subvert, regardless of the unheard voices you wish to amplify. How you present it is just as important as what you wish to say if you actually cared about making social progress. However, I do think underneath all of this trash is a gem, which was lightly visited in both episodes. Wait, this isn't so bad. No, it's not bad, Velma. But it's going to be! This is Velma's mom, and we primarily see her in flashbacks, and there's a big reason as to why. I grew bold and sought mysteries of my own. But instead of feeling excited I found my Christmas presents, I felt terrible. My mom felt so bad for me, she ran out to buy something I could unwrap Christmas morning. That was the last time I ever saw her. Velma could have been a fantastic show, and there's a simple fix. There's one unifying theme that connects so much in Velma that it does not tap into nearly enough. Pressure. In the real world, there's always pressure. Pressure to break the generational curse of your family's vices or financial burdens. Pressures to navigate through a world that judges you on your surface level features. Pressures that other people who are born better off are surpassing you when you have finite time and resources. Pressure to fit in with your peers that don't look, talk, dress, or act like you at all. And so many more pressures that make you feel like you're being left behind. This can lead into anxiety or depression, which Velma seems to deal with to a certain extent within this show. What if Velma focus less on needless meta commentary and less scenes that were raunchy and trying to sell sex and endless bickering between characters historically known to be friends. What if Velma was about a young girl dealing with the external pressures of a society that hasn't been historically nice to her based off of surface level traits, balanced with the internal pressures of her managing her mental health figuring out the true mystery as to why her mother left her. The pressure is on Velma because the truth is, this franchise can pump out three more versions of you in its sleep and get away with it too, because we miss those meddling kids and their blasted dogs.